Hello, I want to welcome you all again to this webinar, uh, which will provide really great insight on uh, the, uh, the program in human rights uh, master's program. So a little about myself. My name is Justin Lombardi. I'm a recent graduate of the human rights program. I graduated this May in, uh, of 2021, and uh, I really enjoyed the program, and it's a uh, has a fantastic selection of courses. And uh, I'm here with William Saunders, who is the director of the Masters in Human Rights program. So it's a one year interdisciplinary program, uh, but there's also, a, which is the full-time option. So it would take about one year if you're doing uh, the program full-time. And if, if you do it part-time, it's about, uh, there, there's some flexibility with that, but we'll learn more. We'll, uh, We'll learn more about that from Bill Saunders himself. Uh, Bill, can you hear me uh, well? Is my mic good? Yes, yeah, fine. Okay. It's fine, Justin. Okay, great. So uh, this event is being recorded. Uh, and during the, the, the conversation, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Don't hesitate to submit your questions to the Q&A chat, which is at the bottom of the Zoom uh, platform. So, uh, so uh, a, a little more. Uh, so, I'm a, uh, a graduate of the College of the Holy Cross, uh, class of 2020. I earned a bachelor's, bachelor's in history. And why did I choose uh, to enter into the Masters in Human Rights program? It, it was because of uh, I, aside from loving history, European history and learning about uh, the great tragedies of the 20th century, but also the, the great ways that uh, people seek to uh, do the good and uh, advance the common good. Well, I love theology and philosophy too. So the human rights program offered classes in theology, philosophy, law, and a bunch of other uh, subjects. So uh, the director of the program is Bill, uh, is Bill Saunders. He, is a human rights warrior, and uh, he has experience. He's a, a, a graduate of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where, uh, and he is also a graduate of Harvard Law School. And for many years, he served uh, as a lawyer. He's an, a lawyer with international expertise. He helped serve as a, a United Nations diplomat uh, during the early 2000s under the George W. Bush administration. And he's also, uh, been a part of uh, key inter uh, international law cases. So, but uh, he has a much experience on the ground protecting those who uh, are, whose human rights are being violated and violated and their human dignity is being abused in Sudan. So uh, Bill, could you share a little about uh, what are the, the great strengths of this program? What uh, you have to offer uh, perspective, uh, why students should, uh, uh, have confidence that coming into this program, they're going to be really equipped for the necessary tools to uh, go out into the world, which is often confused and lacks uh, a focus on uh, human rights and what is conducive to human flourishing, which is uh, at the core mission of the Institute of Human Ecology to provide a substantive vision of what contributes to human flourishing. Well, like you said, Justin, I have a lot of experience in human rights. I've been doing it for about 30 years, and this program is uh, a cap uh, of all of my experience. I was brought in to Catholic University about three years ago to start the program because the university wanted to provide uh, graduates uh, who were equipped to make arguments in the public square about human rights, who understood human rights from a variety of perspectives but particularly rooted in Catholic social thought. And uh, that's my background, that's what I've been doing. So that's what I'm doing in the program. Um, so that's my personal experience, which we do bring into the program. As you mentioned, we, uh, we talk about things like uh, Sudan and China. Um, and I will mention at this point that one of the people we work with in the program is this this fellow right here, Chen Guang Chen. He's called the he's called the barefoot lawyer. He's a very famous dissident. I mean, I just went to a event on China this week uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, 
and Chen Guangchen was one of the speakers uh, because China poses a threat to not only military threats and not only cultural threats, but a threat to the whole human rights project because they argue that you don't have to uh, observe human rights, you simply have to kind of provide uh, economic growth. And they're quite totalitarian. So one of the things we do in the program is we work with Chen Guangchen and people learn about it. So it's my experience, the experience of people like him. Just today, my students and I went and met with some human rights uh, NGOs to talk about human rights issues. So there's all those folks involved that give the perspective of uh, practitioners in the field. And then uh, I think you mentioned it's an interdisciplinary program. So we have a number of professors uh, from Catholic University who are first class world renowned people in things like philosophy, theology, law, uh, political theory. So we put that together also in the context of Catholic social thought which uh, includes an extensive uh, study of the encyclicals, particularly of John Paul II, Pope John Paul II. And uh, all that together provides a unique uh, uh, perspective on human rights, a deep perspective on human rights. And as I mentioned, the fact that we're in Washington DC is also a big help because I, if you want to work work in the field, this is a, one of the main cities to do it. Yes, exactly. Uh, like DC is a really excellent opportunity. So during the Masters in Human Rights program, Bill Saunders and the, my fellow Masters in Human Rights students, we heard from various uh, employees or leaders at various NGOs seeking to secure uh, or in advance uh, human rights and protect uh, human beings at, at the legislative uh, uh, NGO uh, uh, plane of action. So that was really great. Uh, so would you, so, so for students who are in undergraduate school, they might be a philosophy, theology, history, international relations, or a political science major, or finance or biology, why, uh, Bill, why would you say that uh, this program is a great uh, uh, following from your undergraduate experience going into graduate school, or even if you're in, uh, if you have previous graduate school experience, why this program serves as uh, a real platform to sharpen your skills and gain a real great experience going to an excellent graduate school in this, uh, the nation's capital, and also the ability to work professionally, I forgot to mention earlier, but there's an internship component of the human rights program, which is a real valuable, uh, which I found it to be a cornerstone of the uh, program for myself. And uh, uh, so, yeah, Bill, could, uh, could you answer that? Justin, I'm not sure what the question was exactly, but uh, it's what I said a minute ago. The reason it's a good program is because you have tremendous professors. You're located in Washington, DC. I have an extensive network of NGO and governmental contacts through which you will make the contacts where you probably lead to your jobs. And because of the experience I have in people like Chen Guangchen, there's no, and also we look at it from the perspective of Catholic social thought, which no, uh, no other program that I know of in the whole country does. Yes. So uh, what, what type of, uh... To get into the particulars, what are some of the organizations that students uh, will have the opportunity to in, uh, intern for during their time as a student in the mass, a student in the program? Well, the internships are, are built around, uh, to some extent, the organizations we meet with in the fall of the year. Uh, there are organizations involved in combating human trafficking. Uh, there are organizations involved in working for protection of conscience and health care uh, or organizations working at the United Nations for, uh, uh, for good things for the human person. Um, and then one of the things that's kind of new in the last half a year 
is that uh, Ambassador Sam Brownback, who was the U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom, is teaching a course uh, where my students will take his course, and part of the course will be working with an NGO from some part of the world where human rights are being denied, and to work on the case of somebody, particularly somebody who's imprisoned, or maybe some other aspect, and then we also have at the university, again, and something that I don't think anybody else can match, is we have the former Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Human Rights named Robert Destro, and he is also going to provide internship opportunities for my students, which will include the opportunity to work with organizations fighting against uh, genocide, say, of the Uyghurs and China. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Indeed. So uh, what, uh, for, what are the core classes that students would be engaging in uh, starting full time? Uh, like what are the foundational courses which uh, uh, for the first semester? Well, the program is, can be done in one year. If it's done in one year, that means five courses per semester for two semesters, because you, you have to take 10 courses. There is a part-time option, and uh, uh, anybody who's listening that's, a, that's working full-time, we can explore the part-time option. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit tonight, but you can follow up with me after this call. But if you take the full-time option, the idea is you all come in as a group. So five or six or seven students this year at seven. Um, come in together, you take the classes together. It's called a cohort. You get to know one another, the professors get to know you. You know, you kind of form a cohesive group that helps one another through the program. Um, the requirements per semester may vary a little bit because sometimes the professor's on sabbatical or something. But basically you will take a course in international law, you'll take a course in uh, natural law philosophy, you'll take a course in, uh, uh, that is connected with political, uh, Christian political theory and that deals with the encyclicals of the popes. Uh, you will take um, uh, a, a course in religious liberty you know, from the canon law school usually. Uh, you might, you'll take the course with Ambassador Brownback which is uh, taught in the law school. So you will uh, get a little bit, you take a course with uh, Professor David Walsh from political science, uh, dealing with either the common good or directly with human rights theory. So those are some of them. Um, as Justin indicated, there's, there's, so there's 10 classes. Uh, one of the classes is capstone course with me, where you will, it was just just us, just the students in the program. And I, I pull everything together, all these uh, uh, complementary strands from politics and law and theology and philosophy. Um, and then there will be this internship. Uh, sometimes there's an elective. It really depends on what the student wants to do. So there's some flexibility in the program. Yes, uh, so yeah, there is really a lot of flexibility. So there's a mix of part-time students and also full-time students. So it's, uh, it's really great. Uh, so like the opportunity uh, or in the wealth of experiences that uh, wealth of experience that Bill provides as uh, and also the, the many various professors at Catholic University. Uh, so uh, yeah, one of, I really enjoyed uh, my constitutional law course. It was taught by the uh, Mark Rienzi, who's president of the Beckett Fund. So it was really an honor and uh, a blessing to be a student uh, under one of the foremost litigators of religious freedom issues in the United States today with a vast amount of experience of success at the Supreme Court. So uh, I think a real great asset of the program is the, the, the various law courses. So uh, I, I, and also, uh, yeah, and uh, the, uh, yeah, so, and also, I really enjoyed, uh, as Prof uh, Bill Saunders mentioned, uh, 
David Walsh, a spectacular philosophy class, modern Christian political thought he offered. So it's, it's really great. So uh, Bill, could you share outside of the professors, there's a, a network of advisors who give uh, guidance to the, the Masters in Human Rights program and support it in, in various ways. Could you share more about the, the wealth of experience? And uh, many of these are eminent persons with real uh, uh, great, uh, great success in advancing human rights. Yeah, we have a, we have a board of advisors uh, that consists of seven people. Some of these people you may know, uh, you should know them all, but I doubt if you do. For instance, one is Helen Alpori, who is uh, one of the leading lawyers, pro-life lawyers uh, in the United States. Also, Robert George is professor at Princeton University and who was the uh, chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Liberty, uh, who was on the President's Council on Bioethics before that, and who was also on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. So he knows a lot about the way the government works, as well as a lot of, uh, he's a brilliant political theorist. So he also knows, uh, is an expert in, in political, and I'd say political and philosophical theory. And then we have Marianne Glendon, who is the leading human rights lawyer in the entire world, in my opinion. She's a emeritus professor at Harvard Law School. And uh, she's also served as an ambassador for the United States. And she led a Vatican delegation, a couple of Vatican delegations to international conferences. And then there's uh, other people, one whom Justin knows well is Thomas Farr, who is a uh, uh, formerly of the State Department, and then uh, it developed a program in religious liberty, and he now is the president of the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, so, uh, Justin, why don't you say a word about your connection to the Religious Freedom Institute? Yes, I'd be glad to. So, uh, as part of the internship component, I applied for the Religious Freedom Institute, which is a Capitol Hill-based non-governmental organization that seeks to advance religious liberty, not just uh, for people of all various faiths. So Thomas Farr is the president of the Religious Freedom Institute. And uh, I really enjoyed he, uh, as part of uh, last, uh, the first term of the human rights program, there was various speakers we heard from and we got to hear from various employees of the Religious Freedom Institute. And so it, that sparked my interest in, uh, in applying. So. Uh, after I, I would, uh, every Wednesday morning of the, the spring semester of 2021, I'd go from constitutional law one taught by Mark Rienzi to my internship at the Religious Freedom Institute. So that was a, a fond memory I have of taking the Metro. Uh, and then you get right off, you're right by the Supreme Court and, uh, and the RFI's office is very close by. So what uh, does Tom Farr at the Religious Freedom Institute offer? So I really got to enter into so I was, uh, I started as an intern and then I, uh, they asked me to hang on for this, uh, for this summer and, uh, uh, and fall and uh, as a research assistant. So I was working on the Religious Freedom Institute's uh, Freedom of Religious Institutions and Society project. And uh, so, uh, which, uh, so religious freedom is, uh, is definitely under attack in America today, but also there's many eloquent defenders of it, like Thomas Farr uh, and uh, Kent Hill and other employees of the Religious Freedom Institute. So my work at the Religious Freedom Institute, well, I got to do some lots of blog post writing, uh, tons of editing, uh, some graphics design work, and these were all professional skills that really, uh, uh, really helped me. Uh, uh, become a valuable uh, uh, candidate for job uh, applications. So uh, I would like to share this. Uh, it's uh, the image will be, uh, I think the mirror image will be off, but this forest policy report, I helped edit it a lot and uh, it really came out well, it's written. Uh, so it was an honor to be able to edit and uh, the work of re leading religious freedom scholars. So uh, other Why interns- you tell them what forest is? Forest? Oh, so- it's forest is an acronym. It's uh, stands for the freedom of religious institutions and society project. It's composed of 20 plus leading scholars, including uh, 
some from the uh, Catholic University like Mark Rienzi and uh, Daniel Philpot of Notre Dame, Richard Garnett also of Notre Dame. Uh, he's part of the Notre Dame Law School. So it's a bunch of, uh, it's an initiative that's led by RFI uh, and it's funded by the John Templeton Foundation and it's really trying to uh, push different research, uh, push out research, accessible reach research and uh, media pieces that promote a substantive uh, uh, vision of uh, religious freedom. So that's what the Religious Freedom Institute is. And the Forest Project. Uh, uh, Forest Project, project, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was great work in there and uh, I recently started a law firm, uh, Kroll and Mooring. So I'm doing, uh, uh, so the editing and copy editing skills I gained really uh, were a great asset for me uh, entering into full-time work. So uh, uh, Bill, uh, re returning uh, to you, what is, uh, I, I think a great asset of the program, as you mentioned earlier, is a clear uh, understanding of human dignity and the human person that's informed and grounded upon Catholic social teaching. Uh, is uh, What would you say is a, a great, uh, why this human rights program over other ones? Where are other programs coming short? And why is uh, this program so essential today? Well, there's, none, there's no other program like it, number one. <clears throat> number two, um, if uh, the vision of the program is rooted in two things. First thing is what's called the Modern Human Rights Project, which is which emerged after the Second World War. People uh, on listening should uh, obviously way too young to remember this and but we need all to remember it, which is the Second World War killed so many innocent people that the whole world gathered together, formed the United Nations and issued uh, a statement on human rights, the purpose of which was to make sure that we didn't have World War III. So the world decided that the way to avoid World War III, which would end the human race because of nuclear weapons, was to respect human rights. And human rights are the uh, possession, so to speak, of every human being. If you're a human being, you have human rights. If you look at these documents, they talk about every human being. So that's one important aspect, and that's where Professor Glendon is one of the great experts on that whole process. But those, those documents, as good as they were, they don't have any deep, they don't reflect, uh, they don't articulate, they do reflect, but they don't articulate a deep theory of why this particular catalog of rights. And so when John Paul II became Pope in his first encyclical, which is for those of you who might not be Catholics, is his letter to the kind of to the world, he engaged with these human rights project and the modern human rights documents. And he offered a deeper understanding of these rights that could help people both to understand why we have particular rights and to think about uh, whether those that catalog should be amended or added to in any particular way. I mean, one of the things we do in the program is to look at the question of what are rights? Um, how do we know what is a right? How do we decide? How do we even consider the question? So, the vision of the program takes those, those two events, really, the modern human rights movement and the engagement, particularly in the pontificate of John Paul II from the perspective of Catholic social thought. And for those of you who don't know what Catholic social thought is, it's basically a reflection of the church on all, all of the issues important to uh, life and society. And that, both from the human rights documents and from the ch church's perspective, is rooted in the dignity of the human person. The whole point of the documents after World War II was that you couldn't kill a, uh, a group of people because you didn't like their ethnicity or you didn't like their race or you didn't like 
their political nationality or you didn't like whatever. Every human being has the right to be treated with respect. So the program is rooted in the dignity of each human person and uh, is really uncompromising on that point. So other human rights programs may look at it in some way, but they don't look at it from the perspective of Catholic social thought. And some of them don't uh, root their consideration in the modern human rights documents, but kind of go off from a fanciful um, reflection on what they think human rights should be. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, in order to persuade, you have to make good arguments. And arguments have to be rooted in something. It's not my assertion of what a right should be, and it's not my preference for what a right should be. Number one, as a lawyer, it better be in a document, uh, it better be written, and it better bind people. So in other words, nations must have, you can assert something's a right, but unless you can enforce it, it doesn't exist in reality. And so things like treaties are written uh, documents in which nations pledge to observe human rights. So our program is rooted in the documents and informed by Catholic social thought. Uh, I don't know of any other program that does the same. Yes, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, in public international law, uh, which was offered by, uh, or was taught by Geoffrey Watson, who was, he's a former, uh, he was an attorney advisor during the, the Reagan and H.W. Uh, Bush administrations. He, he provided, we learned about the emergence of human rights law. I mean, uh, international law and a lot of it is shaped by uh, the, 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 uh, the desire to not have another World War II and a massive war of horrendous destruction. So uh, yeah, and there's also, Bill, you mentioned various, these competing human rights claims and some find, some assert that human dignity emerges from autonomy or your worth is your, your power of volition or other factors as opposed to your intrinsic worth as somebody who's made in the image and likeness of God or uh, so. Yeah, so these are really, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great vision of human rights and, uh, and it's clear and not unstable uh, where power interests can dictate uh, who matters, who doesn't. So uh, going on, to, uh, so Bill, uh, what, uh, what should uh, students expect? Uh, uh, I'm seeking to go to graduate school. Some people uh, struggle financially. So what are, uh, what are the types of financial, uh, the scholarships that are available? And uh, it, would you say that the financial assist or the scholarships and financial support is a real great asset for the program? Yeah, the way the, uh, the so first of all, our program is, the tuition is greatly reduced because we're a professional program at Catholic University. And then the remaining tuition, we have scholarships that cover uh, roughly half of the tuition costs. So uh, that I've been told by various people, uh, various students, you know, really helps so that you don't come out of graduate school saddled with a lot of debt. And we have some flexibility in the award and the amount of scholarships, but as a rule of thumb, it's about it's about half. So I think it's an affordable program. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. So, so what what is the the uh, what is the core framework of the program for uh, uh, so uh, for the for full time students? So what are uh, so there's various courses for a semester, then there's the internship and, uh, and for, uh, yeah, just, uh, could you, uh, go over like the, the main structure for the part-time and the full-time students? Like, what would it look like, uh, right off the bat and, uh, moving, uh, I guess the different steps of the program? Well, full-time students have five courses per semester, um, one of which is an internship and one of which as the capstone course with me. And then there's the meetings with NGOs that I discussed before, and also uh, meetings with people like Robert George and others. Uh, my students and I had an hour and a half session with him last Friday. 
and uh, part-time students, it's the same thing, but less per semester. So there's a lot of flexibility in part-time students. Uh, one student I've had part-time has been taking one course a semester, and um, another one I had took two courses a semester. So you have, essentially, you have to uh, complete it. In, you could take five years single course consecutive semesters or something more than that. And also the part-time students are invited to these various meetings that we have with uh, people like Robert George or NGOs, like the trafficking NGOs. Oh, we met with human, uh, we met with staff people who work for one of the leading congressmen. Uh, so one of the big possibilities of working in Washington is working well, we, and I know some of the people on, on this uh, webinar might not know this term, but we call it Capitol Hill. And that's the network of congressional committees on the House and the Senate side and uh, institutes connected with them, the Lantos Human Rights Foundation and other places. So we meet with people like that too. And we invite the part-time students to that as well. Yeah, in, uh, as like a part of the uh, internship and research assistant position at the Religious Freedom Institute, there were some real spectacular opportunities uh, for to attend summits and, and conferences. So uh, uh, Samuel, uh, in, former Ambassador Brownback and uh, Katrina Lantos-Sweet, who's, uh, who's part of the Human Rights Commission, I believe, and uh, in Congress, but I'm not sure of the exact uh, title for that but uh there's a there's like a in july a thousand uh people convened at the hey at, uh, at the omni shoreham hotel and religious people from all over the world were there so it was so cool to see uh those who had suffered persecution themselves and those working to secure the human rights uh of people throughout the world uh people separated from by great distances, languages, and cultures. So that was really cool. And uh, going off from that, Professor uh, Bill, uh, could you share about, uh, this was before I was a student at the Human Rights Program, but there was the great opportunity to attend, I think, sessions of the Human Rights Commission, which was chaired by Marianne Glenn, Glendon. And that was uh, an effort spearheaded by the State Department. Uh, so that, that was very cool, right? Yeah. Professor Glendon was chair of this commission called the Commission on Unalienable Rights, which non-Americans may not know the term, but it was the term used in the United States uh, at, at the founding of the country uh, for rights specified in our uh, Declaration of Independence or in our Constitution and Bill of Rights. So this, the State Department uh, convened this Commission of Human Rights Experts, which was chaired by Professor Glendon. To, to look at the human rights tradition in the United States and the international human rights tradition and to pen a report, which is a great report. And my students study the report and we had a human rights lecture last fall on the report. Uh, this We have an annual human rights lecture, which the students uh, certainly attend and get an opportunity to participate in. This year was by Ambassador Brownback. But this report on inalienable rights, uh, there was just a conference that I attended two weeks ago with Professor Glendon and Professor George and uh, other very uh, eminent people in human rights. So when they were holding hearings at the State Department, yes, my students and I attended those hearings. And that's the kind of thing you can only do in Washington, D.C. You can't, there's no, those hearings only take place here. Um, I mean, there's obviously hearings and things in New York, but uh, in terms of what the U.S. government is doing and the network of NGOs that surround it, this is really the place to be. So that was a great opportunity for everybody to see it and to meet the commissioners and to give them their thoughts, which the commissioners welcome. So again, it's part of the network of people that I know that will benefit the students because um, I've been doing this for 30 years and I have a, a great network of people. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, the human rights capstone course, which is really a, a great course uh, 
getting to read so many uh, great encyclicals and other human rights documents. Uh, Bill, could you share about uh, this course that you teach with uh, Monsignor Frontiero and uh, like, uh, I guess, the, the wealth of experience that he offers as a former uh, diplomat at the Holy State to the United Nations? And I just, I guess, what are some of the insights that students will gain in that course? Again, I think you mentioned it earlier, but just to uh, return to that. Well, the capstone course has been taught with uh, a Monsignor who uh, was a Vatican diplomat and he was a human rights diplomat. He, his portfolio was human rights for the Vatican or for the Holy See. Again, for those of you, that's the Catholic Church is, is an international uh, legal personality. It's recognized under international law. It has a seat at the UN and at all the human rights groups. And so he was a diplomat for them working on human rights. And the funny thing was when I was a diplomat working for the Bush administration, uh, he and I were at the UN at the same time and uh, even worked together on some things. So he brings in the perspective of a career diplomat. And another thing about Washington that is good is there's a um, an, an international, so you're, I'm sure most of you are aware the UN is in New York. There are also human rights uh, organizations in Geneva, Switzerland. But in Washington, D.C., there's uh, a regional human rights organization, which is very important. And in this case, regional means all of South America, all of Central America, and all of North America. It's called the Organization of American States. And the Vatican diplomats work there, and we have a number of contacts there and the students learn about that. Um, in fact, Helen Alvary, who I mentioned before, works with the Holy See at the OAS so this, this semester. She'll come in and talk to our students about that and you can get a sense of what it's like to work at an international organization. And you get a very realistic understanding of, not a romanticized understanding, but a very realistic understanding of how difficult um, it is to protect human rights. The reality is uh, the world is composed of nation states and, and these nation states are sovereign and they only give up, they are limited only to the extent they've given up power. And they give up power to some extent by working cooperatively in international institutions and then by, or by treaties. But basically these uh, international organizations, you have negotiations on all kinds of issues. So Monsignor Frontero and myself have been involved in international negotiations and uh, students will learn about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, go now uh, considering all the wealth of experience that the various, uh, the faculty of the human rights program you, Bill, as the director, the wealth of experience you offer, uh, who would benefit from this program and uh, what is the ideal candidate for the human rights program? And uh, and then going from there, uh, yeah, so who, uh, yeah, who are the, who would benefit from it? Anybody who wants to work in human rights would benefit from it. There is no ideal candidate. Anybody who works, wants to work in human rights or interested in human rights and who's interested in learning from the Catholic perspective, as we say, the uniquely Catholic perspective uh, will benefit from it, um, which means somebody who wants to work in an NGO, somebody who wants to work in the government, somebody who wants to maybe go on to further study, somebody who wants to work for a diocese or for a bishop or for a bishop's conference or for uh, in the US government or some other government, either in the State Department or in the Congress or in the committees of the Congress. So anybody who's interested in human rights and anybody who's perplexed a bit by the current conversation uh, in the world. I mean, one of the motivating factors for me in doing this program is that arguments that are made are so poor. And I've heard poor arguments made for 30 years and I thought it would be nice to try to counter that by putting out students who, uh, graduates who could make good arguments. Um, so anybody who wants to understand rights in a deep way, not in a kind of a 
sloganeering shallow way would benefit from the program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, returning to uh, uh, the ex experience you have, could you share about uh, the book you recently uh, issued or you were an ed uh, editor at uh, Unborn Human Life and Fundamental Rights Leading Constitutional Cases Under Scrutiny, which uh, John Finnis, a really uh, well-respected scholar from Oscar wrote the the forward to that book. Could you share a little about that? Well, I will share a little bit, but it's a little slightly differently than you said, Justin. So this is the book. And um, I have, I'm both the, there's, I'm an editor along with a professor from Spain, uh, but we're also both uh, authors of chapters. And we look at uh, countries in Europe, Latin America and North America. And it has the concluding reflections by Professor Finnis, which is here on the book. John Finnis is, uh, I think, academically, theoretic, you know, theoretically speaking, probably the world's leading uh, human rights thinker. I, I, I think he's without doubt the world's leading legal philosopher. And uh, again, he's somebody I've had a relationship with for a long time, and I'm extremely proud to have him in this book, but we also have people, professors from, you know, all around the world, Italy, Argentina, you know, Canada, Mexico. Um, but the point of the book is what you were asking me about before, Justin, which is, um, you know, this is from the perspective of unborn human life. So it's not just about abortion, it's about legal experimentation, or illegal experimentation on human beings, but it's based on the idea that every human person should be respected in the law. So if there are cases that don't respect the human person, we want to look at them. And uh, kind of, uh, it's like a comparative law text. Again, for non-lawyers, non that's a, 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 an aspect of the law that's common where you compare one country with another. So we also have Professor Gerard Bradley from Notre Dame Law School writing about the United States, and I have a chapter about the United States. So, and my students will read certain chapters. They will read the finished chapter. They will read my chapter. They will read, uh, we have a, we, actually two of the important chapters in here deal with international institutions. Uh, for the, again, for those of you that don't know, there's something called the European Court of Human Rights, and there's the European Convention on Human Rights, and the leading uh, human rights scholar and practitioner in Ireland named William Benchy writes about Ireland and about how the international court uh, pushed Ireland in the wrong direction. We also have someone who wrote uh, about the Inter-American Court, which is under another treaty called the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights and how that court is trying to uh, push countries of Latin America and North America, but particularly Latin America in the wrong direction. And when I say the wrong direction, I mean expressly less legal protection for human persons who are weak and vulnerable. Uh, uh, again, the Catholic perspective, John Paul II's perspective, our perspective, is every human being. Uh, it doesn't, is entitled, has human rights, is entitled to have those respected. It doesn't matter whether you, where you're located, whether you're in one, uh, we live in Washington, D.C. There's a river called the Potomac on one side of the river is Virginia, on the other side of the river is a state called Maryland. And it doesn't matter which one of those states you're in, you're entitled to the protection of the law. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're handsome or whether you're young or whether you're old, uh, whether you're fully physically healthy or handicapped in some way. You're entitled to protection of law. That's the fundamental orientation of Catholic social thought. I think it's clearly the fundamental orientation of the human rights movement coming out of World War II. Because if you think back to World War II, one of the things that happened was people were killed because 
of their ethnicity or their race, but they were also killed because uh, some of them were mentally or physically handicapped. And in fact, it was started with the killing of those people that led to the, the worst atrocities. Um, so this perspective on the dignity of the human person is essential. You know, one thing I wanna mention, Justin, before uh, we get towards the end and before maybe you give me some questions, um, I do want to introduce people to, to, uh, to this lady. Uh, she is uh, a Catholic saint named Bakita, which, um, well, I'll, I won't tell you that whole story, but she is originally from Sudan and she was, uh, uh, she was taken into slavery back in the 1800s, but she ended up in Italy and she became a saint. And when I, would, uh, when I worked in Sudan, I started an NGO to work in Sudan when there was war and civil war and genocide and slavery going on. Uh, when I would go there, the people there were always invoking her help. And at the time, she was <clears throat> called Blessed Bikita. So I don't call her Saint Bikita. I call her Blessed Bikita because that's how I met her. And um, in fact, this thing on the wall behind me is a film we made about it. It's called War and Faith in Sudan. But she was, her intercession was invoked by the people uh, repeatedly. And uh, so she's the patroness of this program. And some people will know she's actually within the Catholic Church considered a great patroness of, uh, against the trap against uh, against human trafficking. But, and I can tell you from what in Washington D.C., part of the reason the anti-human trafficking movement got started was because of the work we did in Sudan and uh, uh, really the work we were doing to fight against slavery in Sudan, and that was all kind of under the watchful eyes of Saint Bikita or Blessed Bikita. So as I mentioned before, kind of the important, there are many, 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 many important people in uh, behind the program, but she is the patroness. Uh, Saint John Paul II is essential. Uh, also, if you know uh, Mother Teresa, which I think she's called Teresa of Calcutta, but she, Again, not for somebody like me who's been, who's been around a long time. Uh, she was always known as Mother Teresa. So those are three of the saints that are very, very important. And obviously these great minds and these great human rights lawyers, but those are three of the saints that are really essential for the program. Uh, if you know those saints, you know then, and uh, they give you a sense of what the program is all, is all about because they all insisted on the dignity of the human person. It didn't matter whether you're a slave, didn't matter whether you were uh, somebody abandoned on the streets of Calcutta, or it didn't matter whether you were some person sent to the gulag, uh, forgotten, worked to death. You know, they all, so that's our perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well with the intercession of these great saints, uh, the hum us human rights students are in, in good hands. Uh, so going to the chat, there's a question uh, about, so earlier you were talking about the role sovereignty has to play in international law. Uh, so what, what approach have you been uh, taking or seeing uh, or taking in international uh, negotiations on matters of human rights conflicts? or violations knowing that states are sovereign. So in other words, when there's violations of human rights and human dignity, and there's powerful sovereign states like the, like China under the Chinese Communist Party and other areas, uh, like what is, uh, what can be done? Well, <laughs> uh, there's a million things that can be done. Um, if you, if you look at the globe, I uh, told my nephew, uh, if you look at a globe today, it's different. The actual physical representation of the globe is different today than it was um, about 20 years ago or 
50, 18 years ago, uh, there's a country there that wasn't there before. Um, that country is South Sudan. There was no South Sudan in the year 2000. But because of all kinds of people, uh, including the work we did, and obviously Bakita's kind of watchfulness, but also all kinds of people, Catholics and Protestants, who started saying no to this genocidal, uh, because there was genocide going on and there was slavery, and started saying no to it and got interested in it and raised it in their churches and raised it in their cities and raised it in their city councils, ordinary people, uh, as well as law lawyers and human rights activists who, you know, lobbied the government, the world changed. So that's what you do. And if you're a diplomat, you know, you do what you can diplomatically representing a government. I mean, you work for a government, so you have to do what your government permits. But within that, you push for true human rights uh, I mean, Ambassador Brownback back in those days was Senator Brownback, and he was one of the leading people who stood up uh, against uh, the slavery and genocide in Sudan. So there's all kinds of things. You know, you can work with an NGO, you can work with a congressional committee. You know, you can, uh, I mean, ultimately, one of the key things that happened was uh, we spoke in Texas, and I was working with a Catholic bishop. I started an NGO working with a Catholic bishop whose diocese was bigger than Italy. And in that diocese was where the slavery and the genocide was. So we spoke, so I started an NGO. We spoke everywhere we could. We wrote every time we could. Whenever he was here, we, he spoke. When he wasn't here, I spoke. We spoke in Texas. We worked with people in coalition here who had roots in Texas, had family and friends in Texas. And the, it eventually came to George W. Bush and through his church and people at his church who became, as an evangelical would say, convicted about this issue. And they brought it to his attention. He was elected president of the United States. He made it a priority. He appointed a former senator to negotiate a settlement. Part of the negotiation was a referendum that the people would have five years later, and they would vote to leave Sudan. That's what you do. Yeah. Uh, as we approach the one hour mark, I, I think we have time for one more question. So uh, uh, one of the, I think one of the attendees asked about the cost of the program. So in a similar uh, vein, what uh, what would you say are the the basic application requirements, and uh, what is the deadline to apply? Whether you're an international student or a, a national student in the United States. Well, a couple of things people should know. I mean, first of all, uh, I'm sure you, if you haven't been to our website, you should go to it. That's mahumanrights.com. So it's Master of Arts, mahumanrights.com. And you can get lots and lots of information there. You can start the application process there. You can contact me through that webpage because I can follow up with anybody from, from this webinar who's, who has additional questions that we don't get to or questions that occur to them later. So you want to begin the application process and try to uh, in terms of the scholarships, get your applications in by the end of January. Um, we have a limited pool, pool of scholarship funds, and once those are given out, they're gone. So uh, sooner the better in terms of applying um, and getting scholarships. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Bill, so much. And uh, thank you all, uh, all in attendance here for uh, joining in and uh, I, I hope uh, the, the human rights program, it's a really excellent graduate program and uh, it's uh, it, there's many blessings and it, it'll give you really great strong skills to think uh, uh, what are the moral arguments, what are the legal arguments, what are the philosophical arguments and theological arguments for a substantive vision of human rights. So this program offers a real great uh, uh, opportunity and uh, 
So also I forgot to, to mention uh, Catholic University has a wonderful campus here right next to the beautiful Basilica uh, or the National Shrine. So uh, it's a- uh, uh, And you should beautiful. tell them, people who haven't been here, you're on the subway line. So you're two subway stops from the, the Capitol. Uh, so it's easy to access. I'm sure Justin, well, I don't know if you took the subway, but anyway, lots of students do. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful campus. It's a very good school. It's a very um, solid Catholic school. Uh, again, you know, we welcome people who aren't Catholics. Uh, I have students currently, some of whom are not Catholics, but anybody who wants to come should be welcome the idea of learning about the uniquely Catholic perspective. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, so uh, thank you again so much, Bill. And uh, yeah, yeah, the Metro, yeah, uh, so it's very easy to get to various places either. Uh, you wanna see the city, the beautiful, uh, the monuments, the museums, uh, your internship, you might be working in, in an office on Capitol Hill or somewhere else in the, in the heart of the, our country and uh, the political process, nowhere better to, to learn how, uh, what steps we can take uh, politically to help others in need. So uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, may you all have a wonderful evening and uh, uh, God bless. And Bill, do you have any closing remarks? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say like Mother Teresa said, come and see. So go to the web page, take a look. Uh, if you're interested, follow up. If you're very interested, start your application ASAP. Uh, so that you can be eligible for a scholarship. Mm -hmm.